You know, it is a very daunting assignment to uh, speak for these other degree, honorary degree recipients, because after all, they've done something. I just write down what other people do. <laughs> so it's fun to be the one asked to speak. Distinguished guests, members of the faculty, proud parents and grandparents, surprised brothers and sisters who never thought these guys were good enough to get this done, and of course, to members of this graduating class of 2018, welcome and congratulations. I wanna, I wanna start this speech the way Helen Thomas, the great wire service reporter, the first reporter I met when I came to Washington way back there in 1969. I want to start it the way she might have started it. Helen and I covered the White House together when President Ford was president. And one day, uh, the White House press secretary came in and said that Henry Kissinger, who was then the uh, Secretary of State and also the president's national security advisor, was going to come in and give us a briefing. And the press secretary, who's kind of an unctuous kind of guy, said, now I have to stress, Dr. Kissinger has only 20 minutes. He doesn't have a minute more. We must get him in and out of here in 20 minutes. And Dr. Kissinger, of course, being ever the ham, said, well, you know, I am a college professor. I'm not sure if I can do it in 20 minutes. I normally do it in 40 minutes. <laughs> Helen looked up, said, and just start at the end then. So I'm going to start at the end today. <laughs> Class of 2018, this is your day. You work for it. You earned it. And when you get that diploma, no one can now take it away from you. So again, my congratulations. Enjoy it. <laughs> Graduation day is a day that holds special meaning for every single person here, parents, faculty, students, even the graduation speaker. So may I say to the moms and dads today, this is your day too. And what a feeling it is to see your kids walk across that stage and get that diploma. I know exactly how you feel. I had two who did that, and when they got that diploma, the second one, you know how I felt? I felt like I'd gotten an enormous pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> May I uh, also say to these graduates, until you sit where your parents are sitting today, you will never know how proud they are of you. So let's just stop and say thanks to the parents, too, today. And I'm going to tell you, parents, I'm not going to give you very much advice, but I do have a tip. Stay on good terms with these guys. They are the ones who will pick the nursing home. <laughs> they are. I am so honored to be your speaker today, but I have a confession. A graduation speech, when you come right down to it, is the easiest speech there is to make, and I've made a couple. It's the easiest because no one in the history of the world has ever remembered what the graduation speaker said. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Graduation is not about what somebody says. It is about what you have done. So you're not going to remember about very much about what I say here today, but you will always remember this day. All the way back to preschool, you have been students. For the past four years, you have been students at Williams College. But when you walk out of here, you will be a graduate of Williams College, and that has a pretty nice ring, doesn't it? It's also a little scary, but it is supposed to be. 
I know because long ago and far away at a place called Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas, I sat where you sit. And I have another confession. I didn't graduate magna cum laude. For me, it was more thank you, laude. <laughs> I was terrified that day, and with good reason. You see, when I was in school, I specialized in Spanish. I didn't major in Spanish, I specialized it. Basically, I took nine semesters in order to get the four semesters I needed to graduate. <laughs> the grades had been mailed, but not posted uh, <laughs> the day of our graduation. So as I stood in line to receive my diploma, uh, I didn't know if I was gonna get the diploma, after, and they did this in those days, or whether I was gonna be pulled out of line and told I did not make that C I needed to make in the final semester in order to graduate. So for me, graduation day was more of a religious experience. <laughs> I realized that day there was a God. Kindly old Dr. Roman Inge, maybe he was just tired of looking at me, he gave me the C that I needed to graduate. I know this was because he was a believer in mercy, not necessarily justice. <laughs> but in Dr. Roman Inge's honor, may I just say, gracias a Dios. <laughs> Well, I guess I better get to the point of what I came here to talk about. <laughs> now that you have reached this milestone, what is next? I wish that I could tell you that you, but I, I can't tell you this, you are graduating into a dangerous world at a time when America, I think, is perhaps more divided than at any time since 1968, that awful year where we lost Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, and the Chicago Democratic National Convention in Chicago broke out into what became a riot. There is no other way to put it. Those of us who were at that convention wondered if the country was literally coming apart over the war in Vietnam. And if there is any good news that I can report to you today about those days, it was that we did get past that awful time. The ideological divide that separates us today is further complicated by the fact that it is happening, and in part because of the revolution in communications technology that is having as profound an impact on our world as the invention of the printing press had on the world of that day. I'm talking about the coming of the web. We hail the invention of the printing press as a technological miracle that caused rapid change all across Europe. I'm talking about the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. Martin Luther thought that once people could read the Bible in the local vernacular, that it would be sort of kumbaya, that uh, the world would become closer. In the end, of course, the invention of the printing press was a great step forward. But shortly after its invention, people finally were able to read the Bible from themselves. They were not brought closer together. They began, they began to see how different the different opinions of what was said was having. And what happened was, instead of just a peaceful time, there were 30 years of religious wars all across Europe. We, in our day, are at the very beginning of this technological revolution. The coming of the internet has given us access to more information than any people who have ever lived on the earth ever had. But are we wiser or have we simply been overwhelmed by so much information we cannot process it? The short answer is overwhelmed. The internet has drained local newspapers. Once our most reliable sources of local news of the advertising revenue that was their life's blood. It has changed the whole way we now get the news. 
In their places, these newspapers, we've lost 126 in the last 12 years. There are so few newspapers now that one reporter in three now lives in either Washington, New York, or Los Angeles. That's how many newspapers have gone away. In their places, thousands of websites have sprung up, some reliable, some unreliable, some little more than propaganda sites engineered by those at home and abroad who are seeking to destroy America's most essential institutions, our government, our political system, and our free press. We can transmit information around the world and back in a matter of seconds. Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on. Never has that been truer than it is today. Who can blame those who say, I don't know who or what to believe? A recent letter to the editor of the New York Times was headlined, does the truth really matter anymore? Well, of course it does. And we must never forget that the truth is the glue that holds our democracy together. It is as crucial to our system of government as the right to vote. I offer this word of warning. Be wary of those who try to destroy our free press. They are attacking the very foundations upon which our democracy rests. And we should never underestimate that. The confusion sown by our ability to make so much information available to so many has further weakened our already badly damaged electoral system, the way we go about choosing our political leaders. And those chickens came home to roost in 2016, when for the first time, our major parties, overwhelmed and already corrupted by the increasing demand to raise more and more money to run for office, nominated two candidates that a majority neither liked nor trusted. You know, when I was a little boy, my grandmother thought I was gonna grow up to be president of the United States. You know why she thought that? because that's what every grandmother thought about her grandson. But I ask you this, how long has it been since you heard somebody say, I hope my child grows up to be a politician? You are more likely to hear someone say, how can I get an appointment with Kim Jong-un's barber? <laughs> I've just been looking for a place to use that line. <laughs> Such is the disdain in which our political class is now held. We have made the process of getting elected to public audience office so odious that too many seriously qualified people no longer want to be a part of our political process. What we are left with are those who are willing to spend the countless hours begging people for massive amounts of money that it now takes to run for even the most insignificant office. So how did this come about? How did we come to this place, this juncture in history, when our best and brightest seem to want no part of not only public life, but even running for public office? I want to take you back just a little bit, back to when I had my first political consciousness, when I was first aware of politicians and politics. Year was 1948, Dewey was running against Truman, but down in Texas where I was 12 years old, 11 years old, the big story was <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson who was running for the United States Senate. And the reason it was such a big story in our neighborhood where he was coming to make a speech on the vacant lot where we played baseball the reason it was such a big story there was we heard he was coming in a helicopter, and we had never seen a helicopter. 
So my dad took me down, my mom went, the whole neighborhood came down, and all of a sudden, up in the sky, we heard this tremendous noise, and here was this airplane with no wings on it, and then over all this noise, over a bullhorn, this is your candidate for the United States Senate, Lyndon Johnson. At that moment, we understood how Moses felt when he realized the burning bush was talking directly to him. <laughs> We didn't know if it was a politician. We didn't know if it was God. We didn't know what it was. But finally, this thing landed. There was a big crowd, cloud of dust, and the helicopter door opened. Lyndon Johnson walked out, waved to everybody, still wearing his, his Stetson hat, and he made a remarkable speech. Politicians really had to be good speakers in those days, or people wouldn't pay any attention and just wandered off. And most of it was about public rallies like that. So Johnson made this speech, and at the end of it, he reached up, took his hat off, threw it out into the crowd, waved goodbye, and flew off in that helicopter. You know, I can't remember the campaign commercials of, 19, of, of, of 2016. I don't want to remember them. I mean, they had nothing to do with anything. All I wanted to do is just get them off of me <laughs> once it was finally open. But I was 11 years old, and I can just remember almost every minute of, of that day. Later, I told the story of this to Jake Pickle, who was a congressman who took LBJ's place in the Congress when he went on to be elected uh, uh, to the Senate. And Pickle told me, he said, oh yeah, that was my job in the campaign. And I said, what do you mean your job? He said, I was a hat catcher. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, let me tell you something. He said, Lyndon Johnson was the tightest man on the face of the earth. <laughs> who wasn't gonna waste a hat on every campaign stop? So he said, my job was to uh, get, get there, I'd drive in my car, I'd get on the front row, whenever he saw me, then he knew it was time to, to wind up the speech, he would throw the hat to me, I would run around behind the helicopter, give him the hat, he'd put it on, and then they'd fly on to the next assignment. <laughs> I like to tell that story, not just because it's a good story, but because it is such a contrast and gives us such an understanding of the difference in the politics of that day and the politics of today. The people, every single person who had a role in getting Lyndon Johnson to that vacant lot where we played baseball in Fort Worth, did it for free. They had real jobs. Some of them worked at the bomber plant out on the west side. Some of them were uh, members of labor unions. Some of them were bankers. They were just people who either, either liked politics or thought it was in their interest to become involved in politics. Today, we have outsourced all of the things that those people did for free to a group of consultants and gurus and commercial makers and I don't know what else and as a result, the cottage industry that has grown up around our politics for that group of people has become more important than the election itself. They are making millions of dollars, and they're still making millions of dollars, and that is why that we have today these expensive campaigns that good people just don't want to feel many times the need uh, to take part in that. The other part is, is the negativity of the campaigns of today. When you have consultants who don't live in the community making up these outrageous charges that are the, are the stuff of today's politics, if you lived in the community and your candidate loses after you've made up all this stuff, you've got to go back and live in that community. But today, these consultants have exempted themselves from that, and they collect the money and simply move on to the next campaigns. There are many reforms in our system, some easy, some not so much, that we must now bring to our political system, redistricting reforms, and most importantly, finding some way to put a hold on this money that our campaigns are now costing. And let me also say this, by 1975, in the wake of Watergate, 32 individuals had gone to prison or paid substantial fines for campaign law violations. 
today, everything that they went to jail for is now legal. We are going backwards, not forward. But the first step to political reform is political courage. And that is where I think all of you come in. I urge each and every person leaving Williams College today to think seriously about running for office. And I'm serious. Whatever your party preference or your political affiliation is not important. What is important is values. What our systems need is an influx of smart, serious young people who understand the point of holding office is not to get reelected, but to improve the lives of those you represent. Think about it. Those brave people who founded our country were not worried about getting a primary opponent. They weren't worried about political survival. They faced challenges far greater than those faced by today's leaders, but they were not worried about any of that. They were worried about being hanged, and yet they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors to a cause greater than themselves, what became the United States of America. Do not underestimate the power that you possess. Think of those young people at that Florida high school who came together to protest gun violence. Some were not even old enough to vote. But what did they say? They said our schools should not become killing fields, but places to learn. And I want to tell you, we have not heard the last of them. I truly believe we will look on them one day as we look on our, the young freedom riders of the civil rights era. And let me step out of my objective reporter suit for just a moment and say, I stand with those kids. You know, you have spent a good part of this last four years thinking and learning about history. I hope that you will take that as a lifelong passion. And I remind you of what President Harry Truman once said, the only thing new in the world is the history we do not know. One of my heroes, Edward R. Murrow, once reminded us that we are not de descended from fearless, from fearful people. Every generation faces its challenges. No challenge comes without risk. You are here today because of the courage of generations who were some of the most courageous people in world history. You walked across this stage today because people who were not afraid to cross oceans to get here, because those who were not afraid to cross the great continent in covered wagons, not knowing what was on the other side of the mountains. You are descendants of the great generation that was not afraid to confront the Nazis, the greatest evil the world has ever known, because they knew if they did not, their children would live in a new dark age. And let us never forget another part. Some of you are here today not by your own choice, but because of those who impose the greatest cruelty of man upon man in the history of the world. And yet, your descendants, because of their courage and because of their persistence and their determination to stay alive, became part of the strength of the United States of America. So thank you. The first thing I hope you can do to meet the challenges of this time is to restore our politics to the place it used to be, the place where honorable people can come together to work out the ways to improve the lives of all our citizens, the place where the best and brightest want to be. If you remember nothing else I have said today, remember this, you are fortunate because America is still a place where dreams can come true, and you must always work to keep it so. Treasure always 
Treasure always those who encouraged you to follow your dream. They are your true friends. And forget those who tried to talk you out of your dream. They are not worth the worry. Remember as well to help those who have been less fortunate than you. And there is a great difference in helping them and advising them. I think of what Herman Melville once said, and it was this. Of all the preposterous assumptions of humanity over humanity, nothing exceeds the criticism of the habits of the poor by the well-housed, the well-warmed, and the well-fed. Remember that. In this age of contradictions where it is so hard to believe in anything, I urge you to believe in yourself, and the way you can do that is to remember how you feel today. It's not because you have a piece of paper that says you're a college graduate. It's because you set out to do something and you did it. It's because you enriched your intellect by learning things you didn't know and because you enriched your life with the friendships that always come from a shared experience of a worthwhile and a difficult task. So do your best. Expect much of yourself, and remember always that true greatness comes not from the battles we win, but the battles we choose to fight. You'll soon forget what I said today, but you will never forget how you feel today. So may God bless you. The country needs you, and we are all so very proud of each and every one of you. Thank you.